Welcome to the first virtual roundtable discussion organized by the MRF Clinic and the hearing group about COVID-19. My name is Peter Grasso. I'm very happy to see so many of you joining us today from all over the world. I would like to introduce the hearing group uh, to you first. As you might know, hearing has been founded more than 10 years ago and it's an independent network of more than 30 world leading ENT centers and experts dealing with all different aspects of hearing restoration with implantable devices. Hearing centers are committed to advancing audiological procedures and uh, to developing and perfecting surgical techniques thanks to an international cooperation and the pooling of collective experience. Hearing members' mutual goal is to create and distribute quality standards, as well as provide high quality training and educational opportunities within the field of auditory science. You can find quality standards of practice, as well as uh, the training, trainings on the hearing website, www.hearing.com. There you see a cochlear implant uh, quality standards for adults, for uh, older adults, but also for implants, uh, for infants, children, and young adults. You will find quality standards about uh, CI and SSD. Uh, combined electroacoustic uh, stimulation of the same ear, quality standards about the middle ear implants and bone conduction implants in general, but also rehabilitation and more. There you will also find expert lectures about many hot topics from world leading experts, surgeons and audiologists. Today, we are going to be discussing an extremely relevant topic. In the past few months, COVID-19 has changed all aspects of our lives, personal and professional. In the field of hearing implants, uh, as different countries are trying to adjust back to life after lockdown, many clinicians are now faced with the challenge to set new standards in their clinical practices to allow for a safe environment for patients as well as for hair care uh, workers and professionals. And that's what we are going to explore in today's discussions. So uh, the title of the discussion today is setting new standards in clinical practice in the COVID-19 era. And I'm very excited and happy to uh, be joined today by our panelists and moderator, all of whom are extremely distinguished clinicians in our field. All of them are also hearing members. You all know Professor Müller. He's the head of the section otology and cochlear implants Depart uh, department of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University Clinic Munich, Großhadern, Germany. You know Professor Wolf Dieter Baumgartner, chairman of the hearing group and expert in the hearing implants at the Department of the ENT of Med Uni Vienna, Austria General Hospital, as well as the new president of Corlas. You also know Professor Manoj Manikot, Director ENT Super Speciality Institute and Research Center, Mesiark, Calicut, India. Professor Vladislav Kutskovkov, Otto Surgeon of St. Petersburg Research Institute of ENT, member of the International Community of Expert Hearing, and Professor Gavilan, he is Chairman, uh, Director of the uh, Department of Otolaryngology, La Paz University Hospital in Madrid, and Secretary of Research of Hearing. Professor Veda Topsakal, Professor of um, Otolaryngology at the Antwerp University Hospital, Belgium. And of course, the moderator. I'm very happy to announce that Professor Mohan Kamashvaran is, moderation, is moderating this session. He is the Managing Director and Senior Consultant uh, of Madras ENT Research Foundation Department of ENT, Calicut, India. So without further delay, I will uh, turn you over to Professor Kamashwaran so that we can start our discussion. But before that, I would like to mention 
that we are going to record uh, the meeting today and make it available offline in uh, the near future so that it can then be spread. The information can be spread among many experts. So thank you very much for the attention. I will hand over to Professor Kamashvaran. Thank uh, you very much, Peter. Uh, it's uh, really a, a pleasure and uh, a privilege to be uh, moderating this roundtable with so many experts from all over the world. It's a very, very international panel, and we have experts from a number of countries. Some of these countries have uh, already uh, faced the problem and come out of it quite successfully. Some of us are still uh, coming to terms with the problem of the COVID-19, where our numbers are still increasing. And uh, we have to learn from these countries which have already uh, crossed the bridge. So this is a, a learning experience for some. This is a, a sharing of uh, ideas. So it's going to be, I think, very, very useful for almost all of us. Um, I would first uh, request Professor Fom Gartner for, uh, uh, I would request him to say a few words uh, about the hearing. It's, he's the president of the hearing group, about which you already heard, and it's really a pleasure to have him here with us today. So over to you, uh, uh, Professor Baumgartner, to say a few words about the hearing and about today's activity. Thank you. Hello, hello. Yeah, good, afternoon. good afternoon or good midday or good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wolf Dieter Baumgartner, and since three years, uh, I have the honor uh, to, to chair this wonderful hearing group. The hearing group was founded over 10 years ago by the most well-known experts of otology because we wanted to bring forward the field of otology and audiology and we wanted to share our experience also with other departments. So we set international standards in audiology, in testing patients, in surgery, in literacy of any otologic surgery, also for example any active implants, and this is a very, very vibrating group of experts who want to share the experience of over 100,000 implants and some 100,000 pathologic surgeries together uh, with other departments. And I'm very, very thankful to Professor Kamitschwaran. It was his idea that we started this very first yeah, uh, online meeting uh, before the time we all met personally about once a year, but this in those infectious time days, it's a wonderful opportunity, first of all, to see all the colleagues again, and secondly, to talk at this particular moment about the most important thing in the world. And I hope that the hearing group can share with you some new experience or to ref refresh some already taken experience and to have an exchange of knowledge. And I want to thank the Indian group uh, for organizing this. Thank you very much. And we want to contribute our best ideas. Thank you very much for me. Thank you so much. It's really uh, nice to see all of you and to have all of you today. So I will uh, now get the, uh, the, pa the panel uh, started uh, and we will uh, uh, I have a, a, a few slides to ask all of you, uh, which will be, uh, you know, we are, we'll spend about an hour uh, be asking the questions to the panelists, after which we'll have uh, at least about 35 to 40 minutes for the audience uh, questions. I would request the audience to uh, uh, direct their questions into the chat box and, and please direct it to the uh, Merck Clinic which you see there, so that uh, you know we'll collate all the questions and then uh, post the questions to the panel, uh, and then uh, we'll we'll get the answers from there. Uh, so that's the, the the general plan. I would request all the audience uh, uh, to please mute their microphones and uh, switch off the cameras. 
well, the panelists will uh, unmute their mic when they're talking uh, and also have the cameras off. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the entire problem I think uh, has been with us from November last year, as we all know, but in March, uh, on March 11th, 2020, a day I think which we will all remember for many, many years to come, the WHO in all its wisdom declared the COVID-19 a global pandemic. This set in motion a whole lot of uh, effects and had a ripple effect on many countries. Every continent, with the exception of the Antarctica, has been affected since then. The Surgeon General of the United States soon after proclaimed a formal advisory to all the healthcare facilities in the US to cancel all elective surgeries. The idea was twofold to prevent transmission of the virus within healthcare facilities and to conserve healthcare facilities for management of this unprecedented pandemic. The idea was to keep beds available for the overwhelming number of patients who are going to be whom they expected would, would fill the, uh, uh, the hospital beds. Now, the COVID-19 infection, to very briefly summarize it, has been described as a three-stage process as we all know, as a stage one is an asymptomatic incubation period, which could range anything from two to 12 days, and for ease, we say two to 14 days, which, where, when you could detect the virus or maybe not detect the virus. The second stage is a non severe symptomatic period where the symptoms are very mild, and but the, the virus can be detected, and the virus is also transmitted. The third stage is a severe stage is when the patients develop severe respiratory symptomatic stage with high viral load. Now, it is important to note that more than 80 to 85 percent of patients are, who have the virus are asymptomatic. And this has been the world experience and only a very small proportion progress to the stage three. So it's not necessary that every patient goes through every stage. The virus is transmitted through droplet infection, which can happen while coughing, sneezing, talking, singing, blowing. So all this can carry the droplets, which are uh, more than 20 micrometers in size by definition. And they can travel up to two meters uh, distance on surfaces, and they can settle on surfaces and survive for quite some time. The other problem is aerosolization, which is a bigger problem, particularly when it comes to surgical issues, where the particles are much smaller, they're less than 10 micrometers, they travel farther, they can also be suspended in the air for up to three hours, and they can be breathed in by people who are in that environment. So this is a, even a bigger problem. So surgery during COVID-19 has become a, a real issue. And from the initial uh, mandate where all elective surgeries were canceled, very soon the, this initial enthusiasm for a blanket ban on all elective surgeries has been tempered in many countries by other considerations. And this is because of the fact that we learned, we slowly realized that the virus is likely to remain with us in the foreseeable future. And simply postponing elective surgeries indefinitely is not an option because of the long term impact on a number of people. Hence, there has become a need, and the need of the hour is to work out a safe exit strategy from the current situation with regards to elective surgeries while minimizing the risk to patients and personnel. So, we need to have a roadmap. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to ask each of the panelists. I'll be naming them, and they will be sharing with us briefly in a few uh, in a few uh, minutes about their experience in uh, their own countries, the lessons they have learned from the COVID crisis in their countries, and whether they have started elective surgeries, for example, cochlear implants. If not. When are they proposing to start and how are they going to start? So I would like to start with Professor Bogartner in Austria. He's one of the countries which very soon uh, came to terms and, and uh, you know, were able to get out of the problem. Elective surgery. So 
Professor Baumgartner, can I request you first to tell about your uh, situation in your country now and your experience and uh, how you have come out of it, please. Yes, thank you very much. So Austria at day 23rd of May has now only 200 inpatients and just a handful of patients on the intensive care unit. We were very early and some would say lucky, but I would say it's not only luck, it was also a, a plan, a really plan we thought about. So I'm a member of the, of the COVID task force group in our university. So that means not only ENT, that means the, the whole Vienna General Hospital. And we were already aware in February uh, this year about the rising numbers of COVID cases. And then especially when we heard about the very first cases in Italy in February, we had a maximum alarm. And parallel to our precautions in the hospital, we also, the medical doctors, we also informed the health politicians and the real political side. So Austria has a population of 8.8 .8 million people only, so that's very, very small. It's a tiny country. And overall, so far, we had just about 17,000, so 17,500 positive patients and about 750 fatal development. And about 750 people died all over Austria. And there were several reasons. First of all, the, all the medical doctors reacted very soon. And additionally, uh, the government and the health politicians believed us. So they also acted very soon. So we had more or less a shutdown of the country on the 12th of March, which is now released case by uh, yeah, face by face and we hope that we will be back to more or less normal life by autumn so this concerns all aspects of life not only surgical life in hospital we shut down the, the general surgery by mid of march by the 15th or 16th of march to stop elective surgery but we restarted some kinds of elective surgery already mid of April. So, for example, we did our first pediatric cochlear implant cases already on the 15th of April. So, so far, our, our implant program is in normal numbers and normal progress with no restrictions at all. But you need to prepare the hospital. So, first of all, nobody was allowed to enter the hospital. Each staff was checked uh, with temperature, and over the days, each staff was also COVID tested. And even nowadays, uh, I personally have every Monday, every Monday I have a, a COVID test. Additionally, no patient or no accompanying person, no matter if children or babies or whatsoever, uh, was admitted to hospital, was allowed to be admitted uh, without a negative COVID test. Additionally, we in Vienna and also in Austria, we defined some special hospital, especially for COVID cases where COVID patients were. So the idea was strictly to separate a clean area of a COVID free zone and a COVID zone. So this worked very well and is still working nowadays. And at the moment, we are more or less quite back for elective surgeries all over the country. Uh, it's not at the complete normal stage, but I think in June we will be back to complete normal standard surgery in all cases. And what is the most important, we still have these days, and this will not be stopped, we need to have a very, very high number of tests every day, every week for all the people, especially in the healthcare system. That, that's a wonderful, wonderful summary, and I think uh, we have to congratulate you and uh, your country and the, uh, you know, the the uh, authorities, the planners, for having reacted so quickly and and got the country back into a uh, near normal situation. I think it's a, a very good example of how good cooperation between the health uh, planners and the medical experts, you know, how it can work very well. So a lot to be learned from you there. Now, I would like to uh, go over to Germany, uh, to Professor Muller, 
and and could uh, request him to actually share with us the experience in Germany and how uh, they have been able to uh, come in another country which has been successful. So we would request him to share with us his uh, experience and, and, and what they're doing now. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me and having me with, uh, with you. It's a pleasure and uh, uh, I would like to share our experience with all of you. Um, it uh, happened similar to what, what Baumi uh, described that uh, since the awareness of the COVID crisis coming up and seeing the situation in neighborhood countries, especially those in Italy, uh, we were faced to uh, public activities to reduce uh, activities in Germany, but also in the, in the hospital. Uh, there were general activities according to pandemia plans and uh, emergency situation that have been uh, played through and, and plans were made of. And following these plans, the, the whole clinic was centralized and uh, an emergency uh, staff controlled every action. We reduced um, elective surgeries and it remained to uh, the uh, faculties to define what elective and what urgent and what emergency cases are. So we had a reduction in, in surgeries, but um, we had also some possibilities to uh, carry out urgent surgeries and emergency cases. From our access to operation time and operation theaters, we were cut down to 50%, also due to the fact that uh, intensive care units were mobilized to be and to work as a backup for uh, COVID patients. Luckily enough, capacity was bigger than, than the demand. So with uh, 15th of May, we returned uh, slowly back to normal. And now we are with three quarters of our capacities. And uh, within the next four weeks, we will come back to, to normal activities. So some elective yes. surgeries were, were canceled and uh, well, our way to handle it was uh, a decision which needs no surgery within three months uh, was postponed. And there was another aspect uh, regarding age of the patient and situation of the patient. Um, some patients refused surgery and come to the hospital because they feared uh, uh, COVID contamination. Even everything was uh, separate in two lanes, as Baumi has described. But in, in the public, there was a fear to contact uh, the hospital. And thus, we made uh, and rescheduled the patient according to their needs. and. Uh, to their feelings. That's something we took into account as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's very, very, uh, you know, uh, very uh, optimistic uh, news uh, because uh, it, it sort of uh, gives us uh, hope about how things are going to work in our country. So it's excellent. And uh, it's very, uh, uh, I must congratulate you and uh, country for having uh, come out of it so well. Uh, now over to Belgium, and I would uh, request uh, Professor Beta Toxica to share his experience in Belgium because the small country again who had uh, quite a challenge and they've come out of it quite well. So can I request uh, Professor Beta to share his experience? Hello to everybody, and thank you, uh, Professor Kamaraswaram, for uh, having me on this panel. I really wanted to be on this panel, maybe I invited myself, because our hospital is one of the two reference centers in the whole of Belgium, which is a country of about 11 million people. And the other hospital is in Brussels, is a famous hospital for infectious disease, where the uh, Henne Bear sign was actually found by Henne Bear for syphilis. 
And our center is also closely related to the Tropical Disease Institute in Antwerp, where people um, are testing uh, polio viruses by Pierre van Damme and his group. And our clinical uh, infectiologist, Eric Lavrigi, is steering the committee to restart society now. So we are quite busy with, um, with this. And we were not as soon as Austria, not 12th, but 18th of March, Belgium went into a lockdown and it was by law enforced upon society. So immediately we got a request to prioritize surgeries in autology from the Belgian ENT society. But by doing this immediately, we had to admit that, okay, it's just for the time being, because you cannot delay everything as it has been said before. So we did that and slowly we're crawling out of it, but currently we have about 1,380 people hospitalized. We have still 260 patients in intensive care units. And the number of uh, diseased, we have a number of 9,237, as if today, 11 o'clock, people dying from COVID or probably dying from COVID. Now, this is a very, very high number. And infectiologists um, reassured me that we are counting very strictly to study this um, epidemic or pandemic later on in a better way. So if you're living in an elderly home, and you have not been tested for, or you have not been tested positive, but you die of respiratory distress, you are still counted as a diseased one. And this is probably the explanation why Belgium is having these high numbers. Any precautions we took, we will discuss later on, but today's situation is that we could start with the 50% capacity on the OR as if of 4th of May. So I personally started with some uh, ossicular reconstruction. I avoided uh, mastoid surgery, but we did last week a cochlear implant as well. This is a brief summary and we took, uh, well, we half-sized actually also our, our patient clinic. We will discuss these things maybe later on. Not hearing you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll now move over to Spain. And uh, I'm requesting Professor Javier, uh, uh, who is uh, based in Madrid. Spain is a country which has, has suffered a lot of pain and it's come out now slowly. Uh, so he's got a lot of, I think, a lot of experience and he can share the the, uh, the problems that they've faced and how they are now today and how they're looking to the future. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, good. Uh, hi to everyone. I don't know. Good day or good, good night. Um, you all know that Spain has been one of the of the main centers of the of the COVID-19. Uh, uh, probably Spaniards are so competitive that we wanted to win the battle. And uh, I'm, 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 Mohana, I'm, I'm going to free you from the uh, congratulation to our country part of your presentation, because that was a nightmare here. That was a real big issue in, in Spain. Madrid was the center. I, uh, my hospital is in Madrid. Madrid was the center of the of the pandemia, and La Paz was one of the main hospitals having uh, these big problems. We had a whole hospital. Uh, dedicated to only COVID-19 patients. More than 1,000 patients at the same time were COVID-19 patients. All ORs were closed. All uh, respirator machines were dedicated to intensive care units. Uh, the gymnasium was dedicated to intensive care unit. Uh, the, the wards, uh, the corridors, the waiting rooms, every single place of the hospital uh, was, was dedicated to um, COVID-19. Right now, the situation is much better. We improved right now. We only have like 15 patients in intensive care unit. Uh, those who are there uh, are doing very poorly and we don't expect a uh, uh, good, good uh, result with them. Uh, but, but we are coming back to normal. And, and, and in my opinion, we should come back to normal as soon as we can. Uh, because uh, this situation is impacting in other diseases. Uh, in general, ENT diseases, they still are, are, are there. 
Uh, we have less patients in in uh, in, in office uh, external uh, patients because uh, they need more space between patients. Uh, but we are recovering all surgeries uh, right now. The problem we have now is that a lot of patients don't work on, on a waiting list for a long time, don't want to come to the hospital for, for surgery. So this is our, our main concern. What have we learned from what have we learned from our uh, from our situation? Well, I would say that number one is that you cannot change evidence-based medicine by existence-based medicine that was done here. Uh, there were no masks, therefore masks, masks were not needed. Now that we have masks, now masks are uh, mandatory. So you, if it's needed, needed, even if we don't have it. So they, they substitute evidence-based medicine by existence-based medicine, and that was a political issue that was very serious. We have to protect ourselves with with uh, uh, kind of of, of uh, uh, nonsense situations. And that was, that was a, a, a a good learning from from this from from this crazy uh, I think we will uh, be able to recover uh, as as fast as possible. Uh, but uh, we have a country with the highest number of uh, doctors and nurses involved by the virus all over the world. And the highest in, not, not in absolute terms, but in, in uh, as a rate uh, concerning the total population. Therefore, I think uh, we should recover normality, and this normality will take a lot before we can get together and, and get the same numbers as before. But I think concerning surgery, we should do that as soon as possible. Sobering words. Thank you so much. And you know, very sobering words. I think uh, I can only imagine the amount of uh, suffering and pain that has gone into this. Uh, you know, but you are a strong nation. You know, you come out of it. You have faced many challenges in the past. Historically, you have faced uh, you know many many obstacles and come out of it. The Spaniards are tough guys. You know, we all know that. So you will come out of it very well. I'm pretty sure about it. Uh, but anyway, you know, you're you're a strong, strong people, and uh, I'm uh, glad that you're coming out of it slowly, and and uh, we all, uh, you know, uh, share your your problems, your pain. Uh, now I'm going over to Russia to uh, Professor Pusakov, Vlad. Uh, Russia started late, I think, like India. You know, we were quite late in starting, and so was Russia. But now we are still peaking. And we are seeing alarming numbers coming from Russia. And I would request uh, Vlad to share with us his experience uh, from his country and, and how you know, they're coping and how they're planning on the future. OK, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, meeting. And uh, I think this uh, online cooperation is very important at this time. And uh, you're absolutely right that we started later uh, with uh, our pandemia, but uh, now we have about 9,000 uh, of new cases every day. And uh, from uh, the 3rd of May till uh, 15 of May, uh, we had uh, more than 10,000 new cases every day. And uh, of course, uh, the big cities are more affected, like uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And I think uh, half of all cases in Russia are in Moscow. And uh, the, our authorities also say that uh, there are about uh, 50 to 60 percent of asymptomatic uh, cases in our country. and. Uh, uh, I thought earlier that we are ready for this uh, pandemia, but uh, uh, because of uh, some uh, features of our medical system, you know, it was established in uh, former times in Soviet Union, and we still have a um, uh, separate uh, infection in uh, hospitals for 
infection diseases and we have a strong epidemiological uh, service in our country, but uh, 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 it was, I think it was an explosive uh, growth of uh, cases in Russia and uh, even our medicine was not ready for this situation. And uh, now we uh, stop all elective surgeries in big cities in St. Petersburg and in Moscow also. And we do not do cochlear implantation or ear surgeries. And but the situation depends on uh, region. In some remote region, uh, surgeons still uh, doing these selective surgeries. And this, uh, I think, we will start to um, to come back to the normal life only uh, in June, I think, and. Uh, uh, till June, till the beginning of June, we will uh, still have uh, this uh, uh, regimen of uh, self isolation. And now the face mask and gloves are, um, you, you need to have uh, them when you go to the city. And uh, well, probably uh, we can go to the normal life maybe in two or three weeks. Uh, and what I want to say more, uh, I want to say more, but uh, all small businesses are closed in Russia. Only You can only get some food in uh, food supermarkets and uh, some medicine in drugstore. Uh, the, Head, uh, head dressing and uh, everything are closed. And you can, in, if you live in Moscow, you can uh, get a special permission to leave the house, uh, but uh, it is very uh, convenient that you can do it online. And uh, I was in Moscow on in, in the April, on the 14th of April, I have done uh, some uh, cochlear implants in uh, Moscow and uh, from the 15th of uh, April. Uh, so I also had to have this permission and I also got it by online. And now we move to online life with our community of audiologists and surgeons and every uh, Wednesday, we organize some online sessions for audiologists from all over Russia. And uh, the, at first, it was uh, meetings only with audiologists. And after that, we started some surgical uh, part of these meetings. And now we can see everybody uh, every week. And uh, it is very helpful for us. And we can see our friends and colleagues every week. And I think uh, this meeting is uh, also very important for us and we can do it maybe on this uh, regular basis and maybe we can uh, meet each other uh, every week. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, you, we, we will uh, try and do that more often. And certainly our best wishes to you for, you know, coming out of this challenging problem soon. Now, uh, finally, to come back to my own country, to India, you know, a country of a billion people, uh, keep in mind that we have more people here than all of you put together, you know. So we are uh, talking about all of you plus a few more countries put together. And uh, we have had our own unique problems. I think uh, no better person I can think of than uh, Mr. Manoj uh, Manikot from Calicut. Uh, he will be sharing with you the uh, problems that we've faced. And also uh, he will be uh, telling us about uh, his state particularly has done very well. Uh, Kerala has done very well. So tell us about his experience. Uh, and my dear friends, um, good to hear from you. And uh, though the news from some of you is uh, slightly depressing, overall, I think we do have an optimistic picture. We can look forward to good, better times. India, as you know, is a huge country, and then uh, 1.3 billion people. And then uh, we have a, a high caseload, 
uh, we right now we have i think 126000 uh, people affected but uh, people do complain that we are not testing enough the numbers could probably be higher than uh, what usually is but the fatality rate is still not very high at this point of time we have 3754 people dead in our country when you look at the world average is pretty low. Again, uh, underreporting could be an issue, but they say that you cannot really hide death. Uh, COVID-19 has been peaking here. For the last many days, we've been having 5,000 plus cases a day. Uh, uh, it has actually been clustered to 10 big centers, that big cities, in fact. It's not, uh, it's not randomly spread out over the country. There are certain areas that are done well, certain areas that are not done well, uh, especially in my state. Uh, we were the first people in the country to report a COVID case uh, in, uh, as early as in February. We had a, a medical student come in from China, from Wuhan, with a, with a COVID infection. So Kerala was the first state in the country to report a COVID infection. But we shut down pretty early. I think uh, we were the first state in the country to actually impose the lockdown. Uh, people stayed at home, started wearing masks. And uh, for uh, some strange reason, it did not grow as much as other states. At one time, uh, we had a case load uh, which was only 16 cases in the whole state. 16. And this is the time when the lockdown was strictly imposed. And right now, we have opened up our state to people coming from other countries. We have people coming from the Middle East, from uh, from uh, from Europe, from from, from England, uh, and from uh, from US, and also from other parts of the country. So the case load in the state is growing up pretty rapidly now. We right now have. I think um, 278 active cases, but the mortality rate has only been 5%. Now, this is something of a paradox. We, I think Kerala is uh, outside the country, people from my state, outside the country, 163 of them have died. But in our, in our state, only five. I do not know if got something to do with the dynamics of the, of the state or the weather. We do not know. But if you look at the surgical farm, we have actually shut down our, all our surgical uh, um, work Till very recently, there were no elective surgery. Now, what, like uh, Baumgartner actually mentioned, Bobby mentioned, see, there, we had uh, a few big hospitals in the state which were dealing only with COVID cases, and we were not doing any surgery. And this big hospitals were not doing any cases at all. But I think in the last three weeks, we started doing surgery in a very limited manner. Uh, like uh, was mentioned earlier, the experience from Austria, we were testing every single patient. We were also testing the temperature for everybody who walked into the hospital, patient, caregiver, or the hospital staff. All persons wear PPEs, every single person, everybody in the theater, janitors, everyone wear PPEs. And we started surgery in a very limited way. We were doing uh, at, at one time maybe uh, 20 to 25 cases a week. Right now, it has come down to six or seven that we limit. We did our first two implants uh, recently. But um, uh, I think over a period of time, we'll have to slowly start going up. The good thing about our state, like what was mentioned earlier, was that we actually now have, do not have locally prevalent cases. There is no community spread in the state. But the only cases that are happening to us are people who are coming from away. And these people have been very strictly quarantined. And some of the criticisms of some parts of India is that the quarantining has not been very efficient. And uh, a large number of doctors in uh, Mumbai and in Chennai have been affected. But luckily for us, the mortality rate, even in a place uh, where Mohan is, uh, where there has been a tremendous increase in case load, is less than 1%. I think over a period of time, we have to adjust to this place. We'll have to live with this uh, COVID virus for a long period of time. They say that for you to start a, a, a regular surgery in your, in your place, you need to have 14 days when the last case has been reported. And that uh, gentleman is not going to work. It, it is not going to happen. I think it all, you also have to have a facility where in your hospital, do you have the requisite number of ICU beds and ventilators to handle that thing, which we have. Do you have a system of testing everybody? Do you have a system of following up every single person who comes to it? I think it will uh, it'll not, uh, um, uh, it, it, that also we have. For so Mohan, I think overall, India has done reasonably well, though not as well as we would have liked to. But I think uh, in a in a in a um, in a in this aspect, we are going to live with this for a long period of time. Regarding what we have in the hospital, I think all over India, I think Mohan, you have done about a few talks before. Uh, we have been following a role of strictly using PPEs, and 
testing everybody who comes to the hospital, which, which unfortunately does not happen in my place, where the government regulations in our state is that we test only those people who are suspected of having COVID-19. Uh, but like you said, we are trying to get some outside agencies to do testing for us. Uh, rules in India vary very much from place to place. It's all I have to say about this. But I think uh, over a period of time, we will still be doing more cases. And I would say June would be optimistic. I would say that by September, we should be back to what we were before the pandemic started. Thank you. Thank you. Unmute. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it was a beautiful summary of the situation in India. It's a, it, as you said rightly, it varies quite a bit from city to city, from state to state. Each state is like a different country. So, you know, the, obviously the situation has to change. Uh, I would like to take up uh, Bomi, uh, Bomgartner, on a, a made statement he made. He said that he gets his himself tested every Monday, if not mistaken, for COVID. So what is the policy in his hospital for testing the healthcare uh, personnel in, in this hospital. How are they doing it? Bomi, can I request you to, do, to say that, please? Yes, I think this is really, for all of us, crucial because everybody, also Austria, also Vienna, does not enough testing power. And each test, each individual test in Austria costs 190 euro. So the policy in our hospital, and our hospital has 10,000 employees. So if you have the doctors, you have the nurses, you have the paramedics, you have the other stuff, even you have the cleaning personnel, you have 10,000 people and them to be tested. And the policy is since end of April like this, that once a week, every employee need to be tested. But imagine if you have 10,000 a week times 190 euro, no country in the world can afford this. And what we did is we started about six weeks ago to pool testing. So our ENT department has just about 60 people uh, with paramedics and doctors. We have 30 doctors and about 30 audiologists, speech therapists, and additionally the nursing staff. So we pool first, we pulled 10 tests. So we put 10 people's test sponges together to one test. And if theoretically one of those 10 would, uh, if one pool would be positive, then you need to test the 10 people individually. So this cuts the costs uh, down to 10%. Now, mid of May, we are now pooling 20 people. So that means with three single tests, that means that's uh, 500 something euro, with three single tests, you cover the whole ENT department from Vienna University. And this is how it works. So we can test 10,000 people a week with the test capacity of 60, 60 euro tests. And I think this would be also an example maybe for, for other companies or for the German Bundesliga or for, for the Spanish National League in soccer. So it doesn't make sense because at the moment, with only 0.4% of the population affected, which is a very, very low number in Austria now. But nevertheless, uh, we are not we are, we are not immune competent. So the, the virus can come back at any moment. But with the pool testing, you cut the costs enormously on the safe side. Thank you so much. We have. Uh... In fact, in India, we have more or less uh, uh, copied the same thing. You know, we have adapted the same policy of pool testing to cut down the cost in, 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 in a number of big cities. And uh, we, uh, in an organization, we pool test a number of people together. And then, as you say, if one of them turns positive, then we look at it individually. Now, coming over to the problems in autology, uh, I'm going to ask the panel, you know, if... Uh, any of you have any thoughts on the subject? But what about COVID-19 and the year? I know we have had anecdotal reports from different parts of the world of people uh, seeing uh, you know, patients affected with COVID-19, uh, having hearing loss, having problems in the ear. Now, I would like to ask you all, you know, maybe we can start off with, uh, uh, with Professor Muller. Uh, and, uh, you know, have you seen any patients with COVID-19 having hearing loss or any other problems in the ear? No, I've 
personally have not seen uh, hearing loss uh, associated with COVID. Um, I've spoken to uh, younger doctors who are more involved and closer with the COVID patients in the separate area of the hospital, uh, but they haven't seen uh, hearing loss. Um, I tried to alert them to look after that and, and check whether we can find something since uh, the discussion is on that uh, also nerve nerves can be affected by the virus. But so far, there is no feedback uh, coming to me that uh, we have associated hearing loss or something. Uh, Javier, uh, what about you in, in uh, Madrid? Have you uh, seen, you had big numbers, have you seen any patient presenting with hearing loss, COVID uh, positive patient? No, we, we have no cases, but I, I, I am aware that uh, some sudden he, uh, hearing loss has been the published concerning the, uh, the infection with COVID-19. And uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the effect of uh, intravascular coagulation that is associated with the, with the virus can be the source of potential uh, of potential uh, sudden hearing loss. But I have no personal experience on that. We haven't seen uh, patients uh, with that. Uh, but I, I think all, all the situation right now must be taken uh, very carefully concerning the publications because everyone now wants to be the first uh, reporting something. So before we are aware of that, uh, I have no experience on, on special. Thank you. Thank you. What about uh, with that? What about Belgium? You know, are there any reports from Belgium of uh, hearing loss from COVID-19? Um, I agree with uh, all my uh, other panelists here. We have not had uh, any possibility to substantiate ear disease to COVID. So, yes, we've seen a lot of references because of the lockdown and other colleagues sending us in their emergencies, but I have not been able to relate any possible sudden deafness or facial palsy to, to COVID. So, uh, Vlad, what about you? Have you uh, seen or have you heard of any uh, problems in Russia with any COVID-19 patient pressing with hearing loss? Um, I can join yeah. my colleagues and say that we have no experience with this. So I never heard about this from my colleagues who work with COVID patients. So personally, I have no contact with these patients. What about Manoj? Uh, Manoj, have you seen or heard of any uh, certain hearing loss or hearing loss from COVID-19? No, Mon. I've been in I've been in close touch with all the professors of EHD in medical colleges who are handling COVID patients. None of them have seen any single case with a with a ear-related complaint. We have not had any anyone. I think I've, I've deliberately kept uh, Bomi to the last because I know he has uh, something to add on to this. So, uh, Bomi, can you tell us about your experience? Have you uh, come across patients with hearing loss, COVID-19 positive patients? And if so, how have you managed it? No, we have we've looked at about 200 COVID patients with only stage 2 sym symptomatic, so not the intensive cares. There were uh, two or three with a kind of sudden hearing loss, but if this is really COVID related or just a coincidence is not clear. So actually, I, I doubt that it's really a causal thing. I think it's a few cases might be a coincidence. Right. Thank you so much. So I think uh, although there are anecdotal reports from different parts of the world of sudden hearing loss in patients, uh, in fact, there's one report, interesting report from, from the U.S. Uh, of a lady who had a sudden hearing loss, but then who recovered spontaneously. And uh, about four or five days ago, uh, we had another webinar where Thomas Lennart was uh, one of the panelists, and he, he told, uh, told us that he has actually done a cochlear implant on a patient with uh, bilateral profound hearing loss, sudden onset, was, uh, which is attributed to COVID-19, in another way, healthy patient. And he also thought it was probably due to intravascular coagulation. Uh, but whatever it is, you know, he did an implant and the patient is doing well. So that's the only report I, I actually came across from a surgeon of uh, intervening. But uh, overall, it doesn't seem to be affecting the uh, ear as much as it's affecting the other systems. So that's uh, good news for us, I think. 
Now, you know, the, we all talked about this stratification of surgery. When you're trying to come back to normalcy, it's important for us to stratify the risk of a particular surgery. And for this, we have to prioritize the surgery. How important is it? How urgent it is? Uh, also look at the potential for aerosolization because a number of ENT, particularly autology, has a big potential for aerosolization, which could pose a problem to the personnel in the in the OR. And uh, also a knowledge about the, uh, the the current statistics of corona in your own community. Obviously, this also has to be taken into consideration. So, keeping all this in mind. I'm going to now, uh, you know, ask uh, a little bit about the prioritization of surgery. Now, if you're going to be starting your routine surgeries, which are the surgeries that you think you will be starting first, and uh, where will you be giving priority? So, I have just put in a list of cases here, uh, and uh, you know, so, uh, operating procedures. And I'm going to ask one or two of you. So, maybe I could start with the countries which have started work. So let's ask uh, Professor Muller, uh, which are the operations he started first in elective surgeries, and uh, which are the ones that uh, you're doing now, and which are the ones you're going to be starting soon? Well, uh, we haven't stopped through the COVID uh, times with uh, cholecystoma surgery or with uh, uh, inflammatory diseases, also with tympanomastoid surgeries. Um, while the situation is going more to normal, we started uh, with all the other surgeries like staples surgery uh, and uh, continue with the chronic ear disease, uh, chronic otitis media and cholecystoma and infections and tumors of the mastoid as uh, on a normal level. When it comes to highly elective surgeries like staples surgery, we simply uh, ask, as we said, uh, we ask the patients how they feel about uh, their risk to get or their fear to be infected with corona in the clinic. And depending on that, we, we schedule the situation. There is another fact that we are observing right now. Since uh, the public lockdown has uh, closed many restaurants, many services and many businesses, People who need elective surgery from these uh, professional groups, they come and ask to have their surgery uh, while they're in the lockdown. So we are we are seeing and facing, uh, on the other hand, quite a number of patients asking for being operated uh, right away in this uh, quiet business period for them. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have to stratify the risks in cochlear implant surgery. On one side, we are looking at the, the potential for aerosolization. On the other side, also the realization that we need to intervene, uh, particularly in pediatric cochlear implantation. We can't be endlessly postponing. So we have to triage this. So I would like to ask, uh, you know, one or two of you about what, in your opinion, are the urgent indications for cochlear implantation? And you have to do it soon, maybe within uh, uh, the first month or so. A semi-urgent, where you think you could postpone for two or three months, and maybe, and uh, the ones which are not urgent, where you can delay beyond, uh, let's say, two months. So can I ask, start off with Manoj. Manoj, can you please tell us, in your opinion, would, what would constitute an urgent indication or CI, which cannot wait beyond a few days or maximum maybe a week or two. Obviously, I think uh, when you have a post meningitis deafness, you really have to do immediately. I don't think there's been any. I think for the very first time when the FDA and, and the guidelines came on, um, uh, meningitis has been something that we could never ever had stopped, however bad the situation was. Same would be a young child uh, who might uh, be beyond the age of uh, optimal benefit. So if you have somebody who's like about a year old and then uh, we can wait for two or three months, probably with good therapy is okay. But then as the child goes older, we are going to look at a situation where the benefit is going to be less. Since then, you know, we are now uh, always operating on very young children below the age of one year, I would say a young infant is, is a semi-urgent case. Now, somebody's got uh, uh, other coexistent problems which are affecting hearing like uh, loss of vision, 
like in um, uh, the certain syndromes, somebody with having a hearing issue, uh, there might be a problem where uh, delay in surgery might affect habilitation a little bit. I think certainly if you look at delayed CI, I would look at somebody having a, a sequential implant on the other side who's doing very well, uh, would uh, definitely be their CI. A semi urgent would still mean uh, somebody who's an adult who has been suffering, who's been wanting to get back to work, who's been uh, really been affected by hearing loss. Uh, I think uh, if you have a looking at a sequential second year, uh, we can delay it uh, indefinitely. All the others, um, semi-urgent cases, uh, I think three, four months by the time this is over should be fine. But I think if you look at it from the urgent part of it, I would still say uh, only meningitis. Thank you very much, uh, Manoj. I, I think, uh, you know, these are all some very... Uh, Vivid situations where you have, as you said, uh, ossification, post meningitic. Here is a proposed CI infection, you know, a biofilm which has been managed in the past. But again, patients come back with the biofilm. Obviously, you can't be we're delaying this uh, for long. So, there are uh, clear indications. Now, this is a statement which is a little created a lot of controversy. You know, the statement by Professor Helen Callington, you know, who happens to be the chair of BCIG now. And uh, what she said was that. CI surgery in a young child is a neurolinguistic emergency. What she's trying to say is that you can't delay this beyond, you know, a, a few weeks or at the most a, a month or two in a child. Now, I would like to ask uh, Professor Baumgartner his views on this statement. You know, this is a, a statement which created immediately a lot of reaction from various quarters. Some, uh, some simply thought it was nonsense. Some people said it's, there's a lot of sense to it. So, what is Professor Baumgartner's opinion on this statement? Is this is CI surgery, a pediatric CI surgery, a neuro linguistic emergency? If so, how soon should we do it? How, what is the maximum period we can delay? It? Yes, so I I support this absolutely. So, so this sentence could be also from from myself. So, uh, having a congenital bilateral deafness or an acquired bilateral deafness. It is an emergency, of course, because uh, in my opinion, deafness, it's not a lifestyle. Uh, it is a handicap which can be solved and it can be solved wonderful with cochlear implants. We know this now over 50 years and I think it's our responsibility as a medical doctor to offer this and to do it and to implant it. So our youngest kids we implanted are about six months old. But this is a very special thing. I do not want to have a challenge or a competition who we do the youngest child, the youngest pediatric implant. I think this is nonsense. But we, we, we have about six months because we need a diagnostic safety and a diagnostic reliability. We need genetic testing. So we have a full panel of preoperative examinations we need to fulfill. And we also have seen sometimes uh, the results are not consistent. We can have premature birth, so we can have children who come in the pregnancy week 26 or in the pregnancy week 30 who are really premature. Then you need to long to wait a longer period. But uh, six to eight or nine months is really a good date. For sure, we should implant congenitally deaf children under. 12 months old or under in the year one. And if we have a post meningitic child, we need to implant as soon as possible. I have never seen now in over 30 years, I have never seen a meningitis deaf patient or a meningitic deaf child who came back to hearing. I've never seen that. So we need to implant them in the first six to eight weeks. I think three months post meningitis is the absolute maximum. Thank you so much. That was a very clear message. So I think uh, the message is loud and clear. We cannot delay indefinitely uh, implantation in children. The sooner we do it, the better. And there's a lot of uh, sense to be had in that statement that it is a neurolinguistic emergency. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it, even, it may not be a desperate emergency in a sense you've got to do it today like an airway obstruction, but you can't also sit on it uh, because there are profound uh, consequences in the future outcomes for the child. So uh, this is a message. Now, uh, I, I would like to now uh, ask uh, 
the uh, of course the the uh, the silver lining in the cloud is that in children of course a lot of them seem to be quite resistant to covid-19 and if they even if they're infected it's an extremely benign cause so that we have to keep in mind uh, now coming to the next statement which is the knowledge of the uh, community status of covid-19 infection now this was a statement made by the american surgeons association that they said that the incubation period considering it's about 2 weeks you have to the earliest time that you could start elective surgeries would be a minimum of 2 weeks following a clearly established downward trend or at least a plateauing of the curve or a flattening of the curve of uh, covid-19 cases and some of them even recommended the many of the epidemiologists recommended a minimum of 4 weeks to allow for a second wave phenomenon so in other words what the american surgeons association recommended at a very early stage was that the earliest you could start your elective surgery would be at least about 4 weeks after a flattening of the curve of covid-19 now uh, i i want to ask uh, you know the panel uh, one or two of you would you consider the prevalence of covid-19 in the community in which the patient resides when you are taking a decision about starting your uh, your elective surgeries so this question goes to uh, uh, professor that uh, belgium so uh, is is this uh, do you think this is a reasonable statement or is it uh, you know a load of rubbish uh, what what is your opinion on this I think we have uh, Professor Veda. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Uh, I would like to emphasize this is an opinion, but it is actually what happened in Belgium. In the beginning, everybody was afraid of Spanish and Italian um, situations in the healthcare, so we do the lockdown and an immediate stop for flattening the curve. From the moment the curve was really established that it was flattened, um, we waited a bit more and then. piece by piece we were allowed into surgery i don't know if it was a well thought strategy because this advice came later but rather than the community i think it's 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 the hospital you know can you reassure a safe traffic in your hospital because it's the contamination risk obviously in your hospital that is much more decisive in doing elective surgeries that's that's my opinion again excellent and that's a good point now can i ask uh, professor kevin and you know have you uh, what is your opinion on this okay uh cold statement uh but from a practical standpoint uh, i don't i don't we didn't leave that situation i mean we were overwhelmed by the by the pandemia uh, at the beginning and i think as soon as we started to go back to normal we started to go to to normal surgery of course by by ranking the the risk of of surgery so in my opinion this may be good if it's possible to do but if, if you're overwhelmed by by the by the number of patients you don't consider this and once you get rid of this uh, uh, surcharge of your system then i think you can move to to do normal surgery using just a logic uh, way of, of of planning the operation depending on on the most uh, important or serious to the less important or, or less less uh, urgent uh, the next uh, next uh, consideration is the preoperative uh, you know uh, workup now uh, how things have changed mm -hmm. isn't it the world we knew uh, before march is now changed so now every step that we take we have to be carefully planning about minimizing the risk of exposure both to the personnel as well as uh, you know cr cross uh, uh, infection in the in the healthcare system from patient to patient so are there any additional investigations which are now required and you know, are we putting every patient through a questionnaire for covid symptoms before they enter the hospital are we screening every patient who is entering the hospital is this a new norm Do we have to do this for every patient? Let's say a child who's coming in for cochlear implant. Does the child and the caregiver go through the entire process, uh, even if they have had absolutely no symptoms, nothing? Uh, how do we uh, now 
look at the new era, new COVID era. How are we going to do that? Now, can I ask uh, 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 Professor Baumgartner again, you know, his thoughts on this? We need to differ surgical patients and non-surgical patients. For surgical patients in all over Austria, a pre-operative COVID test is mandatory. So without a negative COVID test, you enter as a patient, no operation room in Austria. And in Vienna General Hospital, the COVID test is done in the hospital. So when you are admitted, as a surgical patient for the next days, you will have the COVID test done by the doctor from the department in the hospital. The test result is present in two weeks. I speak at the moment, I speak about the, uh, the pharynx and the endonatal PCR test. So not the antigen antibody test, I just speak about the PCR test. So without negative PCR test, no surgery all over Austria. The other point is if outpatients come in to the hospital, any outpatient, no matter the time from one in the morning to midnight, each outpatient, even the cochlear implant children for fitting or the accompanying persons are screened, but only per temperature. So the matter of fact is that we see the patient with FFP2 masks and gloves in the hospital because we need to to treat the patient as if he would be COVID positive at the moment. I don't know how it will be in the future in some months, but now in May 2020, we treat all outpatients if they would be COVID positive. And so all the staff, the audiologist, the technician, the doctor, the speech therapist, the secretary just taking the data from the patient has glasses and gloves and treat the patient if as if he would be positive. Excellent. Now I have a, a, a set of questions about the preoperative testing, and I'll I'll go through every one of them with each of you. Uh, I would first start off with uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Manikot, Mano, Manoj Manikot. Is pre-surgical testing mandatory in your opinion? And if so, what is the ideal timing for the test? Manoj. Uh, uh, Pre-surgical testing is ideal. And with the situation, my state is that we are not um, uh, able to test unless somebody is strongly suspected of having a COVID disease. So what we generally do is that if a patient is coming from a red uh, hot spot area, uh, the red alert area in, in COVID, we ask them to get a testing from the local hospital, government setup. And then come to us with a with a RT PCR negative. But if a person is coming from a low um, incidence area, then we look at other factors like a clear excess X ray, uh, no history of fear over the last two weeks. Nobody in the family has come from a COVID uh, um, high intensity area, uh, and we don't test them uh, specifically for COVID nineteen. That's how we are going at present. But because we are doing very low cases at at, at this point of time. I think that should be fine. But even now, I think if you are looking at uh, a truly safe surgical practice, we should be testing all. But for the you know situation here, we are not able to do it. Uh, I do not know why the government has made it like that, but that's how it is. But of course, if we have yes, a sir. case who we strongly think there should be a suspicion, we send it to them to the government facility to have them tested. Right. Manoj, if you have a patient who is not being tested, in whom you are planning a surgery, what would your policy be? Would you consider him as being potentially positive and take him up, or would you be, you know, looking at him as well? Unless there's no symptoms, you're not, you're not worried. No, no, man. I think we should consider every single patient as a COVID positive COVID patient. See, we have um, right now in the hospital, we have PPE stocks for everybody for the next three months uh, for every single staff of the hospital, so that they don't come into contact with the patient and thinking that they are COVID positive. And this is this probably would be overkill, but it's far getting better than getting somebody infected in the hospital because of our lack of care. Now, uh, now I would like to move over to uh, Prof. Uh, Professor Vedat. Uh, you've done an antigen testing. You, know, you have a patient whom you think is positive. You know, based on the uh, history and questions. Uh, you know, if uh, the test you sent is negative, keeping in mind that there's about a thirty percent. Uh, false negative in, in RT-PCR, 
when do you think you should repeat the test? If so, when will you repeat the test? Would you do it, say, five days later, two weeks later? When would you repeat the test? If you think he is positive, clinically you feel he's positive, but the test is negative. Um, can you hear me now well? Yes. Yeah. We do test um, using actually the home care services three days before every elective surgery. Yeah? Okay. So if that's good, we continue as if the patient was positive again with all uh, measurements in the OR that are existing, you know, not evident, but that are possible. Um, we do know that the fact that there is a high false negative rate um, I've had a case where actually the, the test failed and they offered me a quick test, which is some sort of a protein. It is not a PCR test, but the protein of Corona can be tested. And this was quite fast available and it has a high uh, specificity when it's positive. But again, when it's negative, you don't know. I think here we as surgeons and healthcare workers in the OR take our measures. I think the patient is the vulnerable one here. So I would be very easily uh, leaning towards a chest, not even X-ray, but um, um, a, a CT scan, to you know avoid any anesthesia with a silent pneumonia or or whatever. Because if you're doing elective surgery, I mean you you will not the last thing you would want is a patient not able to to be extubated after your elective surgery. So that's the most important point I would say in 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 surgery. Okay. Right. Now, I, I would like to ask Professor Muller, you know, what is the policy in Germany? I mean, are you testing all preoperative cases uh, for uh, the COVID? And you know, are you doing the antigen RT-PCR testing? Are you doing antibody testing? And, uh, you know, uh, what about CT scans? Uh, you know, what is the policy in, in Germany? described with PCR and uh, only patients with a negative test will be uh, undergo surgery. Okay, right. And uh, what about Vlad? Vlad in, in uh, Russia, are you all doing CT chest uh, on all patients who are positive, who are the testing positive and who have symptoms or anyone who's coming into surgery, uh, are you doing, even if it's emergency, are you all doing any PCR testing for this patient? What's the policy pressure? <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, the same situation like in Germany, if you want to do some elective surgery, you should uh, do this PCR test uh, before, but, uh, but it's only for the hospitals who can do this elective yeah. surgery, you know, that in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, we cannot do any elective surgery now. Now, uh, coming to the counseling for prior to surgery, uh, what about the, uh, you know, how do we counsel the patient on risk versus benefit? Do, do we change any of our counseling in the COVID era? Or, and are there any special concerns uh, now that we need to take from patients uh, in view of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so I would like to start off with, uh, 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 you know, Manoj, uh, and then uh, we'll go on to the others. Manoj, can you please tell us? You have blank uh, uh, consent for anybody who walks into the hospital in the COVID era when we take their whole family history, we make them say that what they, they are, and we also tell them that they do understand the risk for the procedure or examination in the hospital. Uh, we are not taking any special consent for surgery as such. We are taking um, this consent for anybody who walks into the hospital for any complaint whatsoever. Uh, the, the risk versus benefit is definitely important. I think you have a very valid point here. The patient has to be told that if it is possible to postpone this to a time when the risk is low, it's great. But in Kerala, we do have a low risk. So the, which is why we have started doing surgery now. Uh, we are on a, we were at least till the last few days, we were on a very big down slope. Right now there's a slight elevation because the people are coming, but there is still no community spread because we are testing many people. But I think um, people have to understand that there is a risk that they could be asymptomatic during the time the testing even could be negative and they would turn out to be positive. So. This is something that they need to understand. But the risk factor uh, is 
definitely there and they should be told that if there is a possibility that you can postpone it's great now we are not taking any special surgical consent for covid era i do not know how it is there but this is a blanket consent for anybody who comes into the hospital thank you now uh, i'm going to ask professor javier uh, in in madrid or in his hospital lapaz hospital what is the policy now are you getting any special consent for patients who are coming in for autological surgery are there any change in your counseling of these patients prior to surgery Professor Javier. Okay, Mohan. Um, uh, we, we have a special consent uh, that was made for the hospital, but we personally don't use it uh, uh, in the department. Uh, we, we just take a PCR uh, within 48 hours before of, of surgery. If the uh, PCR is uh, negative, then the patient is taken to the OR. If the PCR is positive, we stop surgery, cancel surgery. And if the PCR is negative, we just treat all patients, as has been mentioned by the others, as if they were COVID positive. So I don't think you can rely on testing. You were asking on, on a previous uh, question whether uh, what to do if testing was not available. Um, uh, we, we have been even discussing that uh, testing can give a false feeling of uh, safety to professionals that should be avoided at any cost. I mean, no testing is good on a personal basis. Testing are good on a statistical basis, you can have an idea of a super prevalence of the country or of a population, 5%, 10%, but you cannot be sure of a patient saying yes or no because the sensitivity and specificity of these tests is not good. So you should treat all patients as, as if they were positive. And unless you have a real positive patient that you take out of the OR, the others are have to be considered positive patients for the safety of all personnel involved in the treatment process. Thank you. That's very good. Now, uh, this is a, a special problem in cochlear implants in the elderly, uh, particularly in many countries. Now, the elderly, because they consider themselves to be very vulnerable, are very anxious or scared to come to hospitals. In fact, Professor Muller talked about it. Uh, you talked about it. And uh, Professor Baumgartner talked about it. I'm going to ask uh, Professor Benta uh, uh, his thoughts on this because I know that he has addressed this issue and he has some very clear ideas about it. Uh, how do we counsel them, you know, in the elderly? How do we convince them to go for surgery uh, without anxiety or fear? So, Professor Benta, please. Yeah, thank you again. I, I elaborated on this before with you because. We are now in a situation that we want to start up with the 50% and uh, precautions, capacities, and so on. Uh, we don't have limitations in the OR because in the beginning, all our anesthesiologists were working on COVID, so there was nothing to operate unless it was an emergency. Now we start up, I think, otology, our main population is is perhaps the elderly. It's a big part of, of hearing restoration because of um, hearing uh, or age-related hearing loss. And what, what I see is a bit of a trend that suddenly their not so well working hearing aids are not that bad. I mean, people are avoiding the hospitals. We've seen that in cardiology. We've seen that in general surgery that there's a drop in acute myocard infections. There's a drop in appendicitis. And I mean, yes, I have a little of a, a waiting list for surgery, but if I don't do my outpatient, if I don't reinstall my indications on the outpatient, um, we will have a, a problem filling our ORs, I, I suspect. And I do see that the elderly are avoiding a bit the hospitals, especially when you have a hospital that is, you know, one of the two reference centers. This is a danger, and we talk about giving them consent. How can we ensure somebody or give them consent that they will not get, let alone COVID or methylacine resistant stuff or race, you know, MRSA? We don't consent on this. We say you can have a hospital infection, but we don't specifically say, and in, the, in case of COVID, maybe we should say something, or we need to make a bit of an awareness that we reduce or mitigate at least the risk separate traffic of patients and you know elective a super elective part of the hospital i think this will help gaining the trust of patients to come for elective hearing improving surgery thank you 
Thank you. That no, makes sense very, very clear. Now, this is a, a, a situation in, in particularly in India. You know, we our uh, in Indian uh, Council of Medical Research recommended that all healthcare professionals should be given medical prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine. And of course, you know, President Trump uh, in the U.S. you know popularized hydroxychloroquine when he threatened India. Uh, that, you know, if you don't send them hydroxychloroquine, that is going to be taking action against us. And it created a lot of uh, controversy. But end of the day today, I know uh, there's a lot of controversy about this drug. We, we have had a, a few healthcare workers actually dying from hydroxychloroquine because of its cardiotoxicity. And uh, people have questioned whether this actually does, uh, you know, give any prophylaxis. Now, have any one of you in any of your countries uh, have used any prophylaxis in for healthcare workers uh, in terms of any medicines at all? Any one of you? No, Vedat, have, have you used in Belgium? I drink a lot of tonic, but except from this, <laughs> right. on uh, on healthcare, um, uh, it has been said that if you have a, a vaccination for tuberculosis, the bacillus, yes. Vaccine, but it has not been proven for yes. with a strong statistical study yet. I know that there are some centers starting now in healthcare workers, by the way, to vaccinate the part and to study this. But you know, it all comes a bit too late. We don't do anything actively at the moment. Okay. Now, can I ask uh, uh, Javier? You know, whether he has any uh, you know experience with uh, prophylaxis for healthcare workers in, in Spain? Well, uh, apart from the from the tonic of of Bedad, not more. But yesterday, it was published in Lancet a study prophylaxis with uh, ACQ, and I read uh, this this the conclusion of this uh, of this uh, study says that uh, each uh, of these uh, prophylaxis was with a decrease in hospital survival and increased frequency of ventricular arrhythmias when used for treatment of COVID-19. Yes. So uh, uh, President uh, Trump wants to inject uh, uh, things in our body uh, and wants to have uh, the prophylaxis, but I'm not sure this is the best way to approach from a scientific standpoint the disease. Very true. Uh, what about uh, Professor Baumgartner in Austria? Any any uh, prophylaxis, medical prophylaxis given to healthcare workers? Yeah. So I I want to go back uh, to your last question. It is because it is a fact we need to live with COVID as medical doctors now for many years. So it will be like syphilis or hepatitis or HIV. So we will have included the COVID test in our pre-surgical evaluation for many, many years. And we still need to have two lines in all hospitals. We need to reorganize our hospital system into two lines. We need to reorganize it in a COVID line and into the regular line. And the COVID patients must not be, how should I say, disgraced or must not have any disadvantage because everybody of us can be COVID corona positive. It goes so quick, uh, you don't know even even why. It's a little bit like like measles, for example. So the COVID must not suppress our other treatment. We need to do all the other surgeries and all the otologic surgeries by our department and also by the Austrian ENT Society. All the otologic surgeries were were identified as so-called no COVID problem surgery. So that means we can go completely in the field of otology, what we do every day with the implants uh, without a special problem. Nevertheless, we need to have additional precautions for us as surgeons or for the medical personnel. So maybe this will be the robotic system or it will be the robotic scope from the, from the Austrian BHS company, for example so that we reduce our infection risk generally, but that's not necessarily COVID related. On the other hand, what is not done at the moment also by the, by the social medicine, uh, how is the COVID correlation to all the other vaccinations? How is the risk? For example, I have now over 
20 years influenza vaccination in my body. So I'm influenza vaccinated in Vienna every year. And, and so far we had, we have now three or four months of a new disease. And we, and all of us, not ENT, we need to learn a lot. So our knowledge is very, very limited at the moment. And we all need to learn a lot. If there are cross reactions or not, we will see. But at the moment, no antidote or no drug is really a precaution for COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, this question is uh, regarding the uh, operation theater. Uh, I would like to ask Professor Muller, you know, uh, we have the recommended negative pressure uh, uh, operation theaters. And if you have, uh, you know, the laminar flow systems, then you have to redirect the flow away from the personnel and so on. Now, are they implementing any of this in Munich? You know, uh, how are you going about it? Have you made any modifications to your operation theater? Well, uh, we have to differentiate between uh, surgery on, on COVID patients and on normal patients for the surgeries on COVID patients, some of the colleagues are involved in tracheostomy and uh, surgeries like this. Uh, they have uh, established a negative pressure operation theater and these patients, uh, these surgeries are carried out there uh, with a special costume and masks under high uh, precautions. For the normal patients, as I've said, we rely on and operate only on patients with uh, a negative uh, PCR, and we will try to avoid uh, contamination with uh, spreading fluids or uh, aerosols around the area and introduced some protection shields around the microscope, uh, use the FFP2 masks and um, be as uh, careful as we are with HIV patients and what we have learned from them, but no, no other special regulations. However, being well, in the age of the, the risk group as well and feeling part of the risk group, um, there has been done a lot in the hospital to protect the patients, but uh, protection of medical personnel even if it's belonging to the risk group. That is uh, handled in Germany, I must say, very disappointing. And I've heard with a great uh, surprise that Baumi will undergo testing every week. And I think this is something what we should learn from COVID that also we as professional have a right to be protected also from our uh, hospital administratives and not only only looking to the COVID, but also protect those who are the caregivers. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, thank you. Now this is a, a, a picture of me in the operating theater, you know, trying to do an emergency mastoid surgery on a patient. Now you can see how uncomfortable it is, you know, it's it's miserable. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, you're being baked in an oven. Uh, so you, it's, it's not a very comfortable situation at all, but this is how we, we're doing surgery now, uh, you know, with full face masks and gloves and uh, hazmat suits and shoe cover and eye protection and everything when you see a shield. And with the microscope, of course, you don't, you can't use the shield, but then we are using goggles. And I'll also show you a couple of pictures, one which uh, was a Muller sent as well. So we are isolating, trying to isolate the field. Now, my question is, if the antigen testing is negative, I think you partially answered that, do we still follow the entire PB uh, you know, precautions, assuming it's positive? I think most of you said, yes, it is uh, positive. I'm going to ask Vlad, you know, because uh, he's been silent for some time. Vlad, if, if uh, you know, you're going to take up a patient to surgery and you've done a testing, it's negative, and you're going to take him up for surgery, let's say an emergency, you know, mastoid surgery, would you still think that a full protection with the entire kit is essential? Or can we uh, just do with a mask and, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a PP2 mask, uh, gloves and cap and gown? Or do we have to have, have the full hazmat suit and so on? You know, can I ask Vlad, please? Okay. <clears throat> I think it is time 
at least special time for us, uh, we should uh, still follow all precautions. Because uh, uh, this virus is not a joke and uh, uh, our colleague in Moscow died of uh, COVID uh, three weeks ago. And he was also ENT surgeon and he was uh, well known as ear and neurosurgeon uh, specialist. And so uh, I think we should uh, still use all precautions, even if the test is negative. And I like this uh, thought of uh, Baumgartner, Professor Baumgartner, about uh, uh, use of BHS uh, systems. And you know, uh, this uh, uh, robotic surgery, I think uh, Professor Topsakal with that. Uh, has an um, experience with this uh, system, uh, robotic scope, and uh, we can uh, direct these questions to, to this question to him. And uh, this is the best way to make a barrier between patient and uh, surgeon because you uh, have no contact of your eyes with uh, microscope. You uh, can operate this uh, microscope with your eyes, with your head and uh, you have no contact with uh, uh, handles, with uh, hand pieces, uh, only with patient, and you can use some sleeves or gloves, special gloves, and I uh, think we should ask uh, Vedat to give some comments for it. Uh, yes, I'm going to actually uh, keep a question to Prof. Vedat a little later because he's going to talk to us about that. Now, here are some uh, solutions from across the world. Now, this is from UK where they've used a, a, a solution, a, a cheap solution, a microscope cover to cover the microscope, another microscope uh, cover to cover the field, and the surgeon's hands are inside and he's working inside the field. This way, they've isolated the field completely from aerosol contamination of the operating room. Uh, it's a little uncomfortable. We have tried it, but it's it's workable. And this is how we have been doing it in, in, in our uh, setup. You know, you can see a completely, uh, you know, this is a plastic wrapper which goes over the surgical field, the patient's head, and uh, the ear here, microscope covered, and there's a complete drape from the microscope to the patient, right up to the chest of the patient another cover for the microscope and the surgeon is able to work uh, with comfort. And this is uh, uh, Professor Muller, who's uh, got his own solution to it. I, I'm going to ask him to comment on this. Uh, and this is uh, him uh, hiding behind this, you know, and operating. So, uh, Joachim, can you tell us about this? Well, this is uh, the simple drapes that are used uh, in, in regular routine. And they are, uh, wrapped around the microscope so I have uh, like a shield and uh, protect myself behind that plane and hopefully avoid uh, contamination with aerosols. And you see there's this one, one mistake in these uh, things in the very beginning. The nurse is, is not protected and this is something that has been changed. So. They also have more protection now, but uh, it is a result uh, of the discussion with our centralized operating room steering committee, who initially uh, did not want to give any protection uh, to us. And uh, though we had to fight for, for everything which is uh, protecting us and ourselves. Um, I'm not sure if the um, separation uh, with the BHS system or something like that is the real solution. We tried something different with the Ariscope, which is the fully digital microscope where we separated the binoculars from the uh, main unit. Um, this also gives more safety for protection, but we have uh, the disadvantage of limited pictures to the surgeon and maybe lower resolution, which may also take another risks for the patient. So it's a it's a first step in an interesting direction. But uh, as far as I see, there is uh, room for improvement. 
Thank you. Now, uh, now we are uh, uh, going to ask uh, Professor Vedder to comment on robotic surgery and also, you know, the possibility of exoscopic surgery, uh, which seems to be uh, promising for the future, uh, especially in autological. This is a picture from Japan, uh, from Nigata, where uh, there are neurosurgical procedures happening with an exoscope. So you can see that it's completely isolated from the field. So this is a big advantage, of course. Now, Professor Vedat, can you tell us, share us your experience? Do you think the way forward is through robotic surgery? Not necessarily the robotics. I think um, ENT surgeons are very creative people. Huh? Um, uh, what is a fact is we will buy more plastic. Maybe COVID is good for air pollution, but it's not good for air con uh, plastic consumption. So what we did this last week, Monday, we had the BHS technology system as a setup because its system allows to click your plastic field on the exoscope viewing lens and you drop the field down to the patient like a tent. And I sent you actually a picture, Professor Kamaraswaran, maybe you can uh, produce it, but I don't have prepared slides on it. Um, the obvious um, advantage was that this system allows to be steered with a, a movement of your head. So you're wearing goggles on a, let's say, bicycle helmet-like thing. And if you click on certain menu features, you can move the, the field and the macroscopic view on it. It is a, a bit uh, um, awkward in the beginning, but the image quality was good enough and you get acquainted very well and easily with it in, in a short of time to, to be able to perform cochlear implant surgery. And this tent-like draping, if you can show the picture, will allow you to protect everybody in the surgical room. And also you can do your incision and also suturing after mastoidectomy underneath that tent. Now, I am sure we can make up this tent-like um, um, set up with a double draping with our own microscope. So it's it's not really that the robotic part of it is um, so uh, COVID proof, but it was a technology that's out there and then we use it and maybe uh, it has the future because it's really already able to, to give you a, a, a barrier between the possibly positive patient and all of the personnel. So we enjoyed it very much. Thank you. So I think we are, a number of uh, measures are, are being now uh, considered for isolating the, the personnel from the uh, potentially COVID positive patients. So you could either isolate the field as was shown or isolate the, the personnel from the, from the patient uh, to reduce the contamination risk, keeping in mind the potential for aerosolization in all these drilling procedures. So one of the options is an exoscope. One of the options is to uh, rely on robotic surgeries in the future. So a number of solutions, number of possibilities. I think each will work out something, you know, but at the end of the day, the idea is pretty clear that we have to think about strategies now where we can either isolate the field, surgical field, or the personnel from the risk of contamination in the uh, operating theater. Uh, and uh, now uh, I'm coming down to the last bit of my talk. We are now going to go on to the questions. But last question, I think, would be to almost all of you. You know, this is a, a special situation for cochlear implant surgeons. You have done your surgery, you've taken all your precautions, and you have put in your implant. Now, what happens next? Now, what about the, uh, the mapping, the switch on, the habilitation? How do we deal with this? This is equally important, as we all know. And how are we going to handle this issues, uh, you know, in situations? Are we going to ask all our uh, audiologists and habilitationists to work with full protection? You know, do they wear masks? Do they wear uh, caps and gowns? If so, how is the child uh, going to deal with this? You know, is it going to think of this alien looking person as uh, somebody who's going to be training them? Uh, what are these? Do we, are we relying on remote mapping now? Are we going to think about uh, daily uh, therapy for rehabilitation? So, what are the solutions now? You know, so can I ask each one of you quickly? So maybe we can start off with Professor Muller. You know, how are you going to deal with this problem, Professor Muller? Yes, well, this was uh, a problem with uh, fitting of the device, and uh, we 
in addition had to face the situation that the pediatric uh, unit, uh, which is outside of the hospital, refused to see patients uh, to pre protect their employees. So people were somehow left alone, which was disappointing. Uh, so we continued with uh, a kind of uh, remote mapping and we kept the distance uh, between the patient and the audiologist for more than two meters. And by that, we were able to continue with fitting. In terms of rehabilitation, by the number of patient needs to see uh, the lips and lip reading as well, in addition to enhanced communication. And for those, uh, our people uh, introduced uh, video-based training, which they offer to the patient to be done at home uh, at their computer, even if patients are due to public uh, regulations in uh, isolation or lockdown. And that helped us to overcome the last two months. And nowadays also with fitting, we are going back to normal and have regular patient contacts respecting the uh, hygiene rules. So what is very important, we must not discriminate COVID patients. So COVID patients, patients like all other patients, they just, they just have immune reactions to a virus and eight, we should not forget 80% of the COVID positive patients have no symptoms at all. So they, they appear is normal healthy people. So what, what we did, uh, we had the shutdown on March 12th. So for, for eight weeks, we completely, uh, we completely canceled the, the, the fitting program, which was in, in my opinion, a mistake, but we had no other choice because at this particular moment, not prepared enough for the remote mapping, remote programming in telemedicine. So I think that the COVID crisis is now a really big, uh, big point and a big pressure for starting with remote programs and telemedicine. And unfortunately, two, three months ago, we were not prepared for this stage. Now we we, we changed a bit and we're working hard on this. So we will still have the fitting and mapping in our department for still a number of patients, but we want to invest and we want to, to make us future safe for telemedicine. And this is the point now. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Javier, you know, in Spain, how, how are you going to do it in Madrid? Well, right. uh, we were not prepared at the beginning. I think remote is an option, uh, but remember, we will come back to normal, life will recover, and we will still be able to treat these patients directly. What I would like to, to, to emphasize is that, again, as we said before, all patients should be considered as COVID positive, no matter what the test said before. So. Uh, I, I, I will suggest Joachim to, re, to, uh, to remove uh, the slide where the nurse is not protected and he's uh, under the shield because, I mean, the, the union of nurses will kill you, Joachim, if you, if you keep using this slide in, in public. Uh, what I mean is uh, the, the people in programming and in, in, in rehabilitation should be as protected as we as surgeons. If you keeping a two meter distance between you and the patient, you can relax these measures, you can have normal protection, but if you are touching the patient or coming into direct contact with the patient, you need to behave as if the patient was COVID positive. And this uh, applies until this situation solves and we go back to normal life, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, Vlad? Now, when you start your implant program, now how are you going to be dealing with habilitation and with mapping? Vlad in Russia? Uh, okay. Uh, we stopped our program. So we and uh, we stopped any uh, sessions, uh, any fitting sessions. So we have nothing now. And uh, what we can do, uh, 
uh, we can uh, support our uh, colleagues in remote regions if they have some uh, interface for the mapping, like DIB or Max. So we can support them uh, remotely. And, uh, you know, we uh, established our uh, tele uh, rehabilitation program just 10 years ago. And uh, now it's uh, second wave with uh, uh, online activities. And we organize classes, seminars and everything for patients, for groups of patients or individually. And now it's, it's a huge growth of uh, the uh, medicine in Russia. So, what for uh, uh, patients who uh, need some fitting sessions or something else? Uh, so we can we should wait. We should wait. It's it's not good, but uh, it's reality for now. Thank you. Uh, now, Veda, uh, what about in Belgium? How are you going to tackle this problem? We started it, and again, I think uh, we we thought it would be important to create awareness under audiologists and all other healthcare personnel. So, um, we we have this thing like audiological hygiene. I mean, as surgeons, you are used to working sterile, but audiologists may not be aware of dangers. So that's the awareness coming. Patients are coming in through a main entrance where there is an infrared camera, so they are temperature screened. But patients who had had surgery can have a QR code and can directly access the hospital without an over and over getting an interview or screening coming to our department. The determining factor is the waiting room. The size of the waiting room where you have to apply social distancing determines how many people you can see as a department. So the truth is, if I do outpatient, I can see six or seven people in a morning in a half a day where I saw normally 15 to 20 people. Same goes for audiologists. They, they do, if they do audiometric testing, we rotate the audiometric booths. So if they use one booth, the second patient goes into another booth for audio testing. At least that booth can be cleaned and silent for half an hour for the dropping or the error realization or whatsoever. These are small measures we take. Um, and it's also, the time is reduced between the audiologist and the patient that needs fitting. The um, appointments are reduced, but also the time. And, and I would welcome, of course, remote fitting, but the fitting on its own, it's not the most time consuming part of the contact between the audiologist. It's all about explaining the features of the device and so on, and the human to human explanation, which our patient value the most. So. I'm not really sure remote fittings are going to help us very much in um, in these times with Corona, but this is how we're trying to deal with it and making up every day something new as Corona has been so far for us. And now uh, we, we have to take some questions from the audience. And I think the first question is from uh, Lord uh, Parnas in, uh, uh, from Canada. Uh, here from London in Canada, he has asked for uh, you know about the precautions for aerosolization and uh, mucosa caused by drilling. I think uh, you know we have all talked about it. Uh, you know we have talked about the possibility of uh, isolating the operative field from the uh, the OR uh, about uh, isolating the personnel for some images. Uh, and I think uh, we also talked about, uh, so that's that's one possibility where you isolated the field completely from the uh, surgeon and the OR. Uh, and this is from UK, you know, where we've done a similar sort of thing, one around the field, one here. We talked about the, uh, was a Muller, you know, uh, isolating the personnel. And we also talked about uh, exoscopes uh, so, and robotic surgery. So, I think there's several options we, we're all exploring, uh, Lon, and uh, I think we're going to be, you know, coming up with solutions uh, in the not too distant future, hopefully. But uh, the point is, I think each one of us is still in a learning curve, you know, so I think that's important. Uh, the, the, there was a comment on the poor sensitivity of COVID tests. 
Well, I think that's a, that's a hard fact, you know, it's that, that the tests are not very sensitive. Uh, so they're still working on it. It's not our business, of course, you know, the people working on it, but till we get reliable tests, I think uh, the panel is very unanimous in its opinion. Consider every patient as potentially positive and treat accordingly. Take precautions. A few questions from Neelam. Do we need a special consent from the patient? Uh, I think uh, Manoj answered this question, saying that you know, it takes a blanket consent, and uh, many of them uh, panelists, including Veda uh, uh, and uh, Javier, felt that we don't need a special consent from the patient. That we have to counsel them, but we don't have to get a special consent. Just like we don't get a special consent from every patient who comes to the hospital for HIV or for uh, any other infection, that they are aware that they're entering into a hospital where potential for cross infection is there, but every step is being taken to minimize. So the idea is not to create panic amongst the patients. So, well, you know, that seems to be the opinion of the panel. Specific sterilization and OT. I think the, the fact is this virus is very, very easily killed, you know, so any sterilization technique is good enough. You just have to, you know, sterilize between cases, particularly cases that you have to think uh, are uh, potentially positive. So if you have more than one uh, uh, theater suit, then it might be a good idea to, uh, you know, rotate between theaters. Uh, in uh, a question from uh, Sumit, uh, in two-year-old child, how long can you postpone the surgery? I think uh, there's again the panel felt that you should not be postponing it too long uh, in a pediatric cochlear implant. That you, your idea is to do it without too much delay, uh, and uh, uh, you don't want to miss out on the the important uh, period because this is something which can have long term consequences. So I think almost all the panelists uh, felt that this cannot be indefinitely postponed. Maybe uh, one or two months, yes, but not uh, beyond that. That you have to at some point, uh, you know, counsel the parents and healthcare workers take proper precautions, do preoperative testing, COVID testing, and then take them up and uh, do the surgery and uh, habilitation and so on. Challenges in habilitation, challenges in, uh, you know, uh, audiological services. But again, uh, with proper precaution, the personnel have to. Uh, take uh, necessary steps and then go ahead and do it. So these are all the uh, steps that have been uh, given. Uh, now, uh, uh, now one of the questions which has been asked is, what about the medical legal implications? If a patient comes to you, has a surgery, and then goes and becomes COVID positive, now can he medical legally sue the hospital? I believe this has happened in Italy, uh, I was told, but has he got a medical legal, uh, you know, uh, obligation? I mean, can he sue the hospital or the uh, healthcare uh, facility saying that I got the COVID because I came and had a surgery, elective surgery in the hospital? So can I ask uh, Bomgartner, you know, Bomi, what, what are your thoughts on this? So far, we had no case like this in Austria. Uh, but from from the Austrian law, from the medical legal point, uh, it only would be uh, allowed to sue. So theoretically, it's possible, but it would be only allowed if this would be a try to express in my best English an unnecessary postponing. So if the postponing is is according to the uh, to the COVID disease itself, so to uh, to justify disease, to treat the disease. So if there is a a realistic lot COVID disease, some postponement time frame is medical legally okay. But you cannot say because you are COVID positive, I will not operate you in the next six months or in a year or never. So, so there are two points to consider. So, so the hospital certainly can say no, now not at this moment because of the disease and because we need to do this and that. But the hospital is not allowed to say on principle no. So, I think this would be this is the legal situation in Austria. Thank you. Uh, can I ask uh, Professor Munda, you know, what what his opinion is? 
Well, we are faced, as Bobby has said, and many others, with the reality of uh, the COVID infection. So the informed consent should simply state that uh, we cannot exclude a risk of uh, a COVID infection inside the clinic, no, we can do outside. And also, delay of surgeries may have negative uh, impacts on the disease, and then we are hopefully legally on the on the right side. But uh, if patients will, will sue the hospital, that will come up in the future, and I'm sure, sure some, some will do so. And uh, many lawyers try to earn money with that, but uh, we should be aware in the forefield and exclude that as good as we can. I think we are now running out of time. Uh, we are running out of time, and we have to come to uh, an end. I think I think we could go on and on with the panel of lectures, you know, an expert panel, uh, of very uh, eminent uh, panelists. But uh, all good things have to come to an end. Uh, so I think the, uh, I would like to just summarize the very important uh, at home points that were mentioned today. Is, is that you know the uh, risk of. Uh, uh, risk to personnel and to uh, you know patient-to-patient uh, -patient transmission healthcare facilities uh, has to be minimized, and it's uh, you know the res responsibility for all of us. We take all reasonable precautions. We inform the patients, of course. Pre-operative COVID testing, if it's possible, should be done uh, for all the pre patients who are coming in for elective surgeries. Uh, and ideally, you know, you if you do the testing, and if it comes negative, you still consider them as positive and take all precautions. So this is uh, the, the, the consensus of the panel. So take every patient as a potentially positive patient. Uh, the, although, you know, in theory, it will be nice if you could wait for the flattening of the curve and then uh, give a four week gap and then start your elective surgery. In practice, this may not work out for many reasons. One, in many, many countries and communities, Adequate testing facilities are not available. So, as we may not even have a clear picture of the actual prevalence, uh, as we do more tests, we more patients will become positive, of course. Uh, so, therefore, you know, you can't rely only on that. You have to think about your own hospital and your facilities and your ability to handle patients and safeguard your personnel and then take decisions about the, uh, the, uh, protection of uh, of patients and personnel and go ahead with the elective surgeries. Uh, especially the elderly will need to be reassured and then they have to be given special uh, counseling uh, and then reassurance. And of course, all reasonable precautions taken to ensure that uh, they are not uh, neglected and they get their uh, facilities on time. Pediatric cochlear implantation cannot be indefinitely postponed. It has dire consequences for the outcomes in the long term. So we, the idea is to start as early as possible once you have the mechanism in place. One of the suggestions has been given by one of the audience is that you could actually put up a notice outside the hospital about the, informing the patients about their, uh, the potential risks involved and how they can safeguard themselves. But maintaining social distancing inside the all healthcare facility, including the audiology and habitation facilities, are all important. Uh, remote mapping and remote uh, teletherapy are probably very much, uh, you know, applicable in the immediate future. And uh, the audiologists and, and uh, habitationists will start looking at all these issues now. Uh, and when you are doing audiological testing, kindly of rotate the patients between different booths, giving sufficient time for sterilization to take place. One of the ways that you can sterilize the audiology booth is to use ultraviolet light. It's very efficient and uh, it doesn't spoil the uh, the lining of the booth. So UV lamps are very effective and that can be used as well. Uh, and uh, uh, I, as a, as a follow-up, I would like to say that uh, we are planning uh, another panel uh, with audiologists and rehab specialists uh, to look at options for uh, the solutions for uh, you know post op uh, mapping and habilitation and so on and treatment during the covid uh, uh, situation so there will be a follow up uh, panel in the not distant future 
for audiologists and uh, habilitationists to look at these two issues. We'll, we'll inform the time and, and uh, the date to everyone. So I think uh, the carry home points are, are clear. Uh, it, it's been given by uh, experts who have actually gone through the whole crisis, many of them. Some of us are actually going through the crisis and we all learned lessons from each other. It's been a great learning experience from every one of us. I, I would like to personally thank every one of them. They've been a wonderful panel. Uh, Professor Bongartna, uh, Professor Mula, Javier, uh, Vedat, uh, Vlad, uh, Manoj. I think each one of them has been uh, so clear in their uh, uh, exposition of ideas. And uh, we have had some very good information given from them. So thank you all uh, for uh, seeing and now over to you, Peter, uh, for your concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for attending this roundtable discussion today. The high number of attendees shows how important and how appreciated these meetings are. So a big thank uh, you goes out to the hearing group for offering uh, this wonderful opportunity. All our panelists, our moderator, uh, thank you for the very productive and fruitful discussion. Special thanks also goes to the principal of uh, uh, chief uh, audiologist at MIRF Institute of Speech and Hearing, Professor Ranjit uh, Rajeswaran, for setting up the conference. And to close, I would like to inform everybody that uh, we are going to summarize the most important points of this meeting today in a short document that will be made available soon. Also, the recording of the discussion will be made available on the hearing website. Uh, and with that, I wish you all a very nice uh, weekend and thank you again. Thank you. It was really good. Uh, I think we all enjoyed it. Good to see you, Javier. Thank you all. Thank uh, you so great much. Great to see you again.